Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Ask the Trainer session. And this one is very special because we have a guest. I'm joined, or we are joined, Ellie and I are joined by Mark Potochnik, or you might uh, know him also as uh, Renda Baron. And he's going to tell us more about uh, procedural shading techniques today. Um, how are you doing, Mark? Great. Thank you, Jonas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for being here. So, um, as always, let me start with a little bit of housekeeping and then we will dive directly into who Mark is and what he does and how he is uh, mastering procedural shading with Redshift. So, yeah, um, here I am on the Maxon website. And when you go to news and events, you get to this page here. And here you can see all the events. Uh, that we are doing as live streams, but also events that we are attending uh, in person. So definitely check that out. Whenever we stream something here, we um, host the recording on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out uh, in case you want to yeah, catch up or if you yeah, just want to watch something again. Uh, there's also a ton of other stuff um, on the channel here. And then we also have Cineversity. Cineversity is also, well, it's our official learning platform, actually, where you can watch all sorts of tutorials as well. And even if you want to get into one of our applications and you are an absolute beginner starting from zero, we have all of these Getting Started series that you can watch. All right. And then... We also have um, an yeah, Ask the Trainer exclusive wear merch shop and a coupon code. And what you can do is you can type in that coupon code when you enter this site, and then you can order one T-shirt for free. You would only have to pay for the shipping. And that's basically the housekeeping part here. So let's jump into who Mark is and what he's doing. I'm also going to play his showreel here. Let me make this uh, full screen here. I hope I remember the shortcut. There we go. My brain still works. So, hey, Mark, it's great to have you here. Uh, hey, Jonas, thank video. you for having me again. It's a pleasure. It's my first Ask the Trainer session, actually. So uh, let me introduce me first. Yeah. Um, my name is Mark, Mark Protochnik. I'm founder and owner of Tiny But Hopefully Nice Animation Studio Render Baron. Um, already in service since 2001, and um, it's a tiny studio, but competing with bigger competitors, and the focus is visual effects, visualization, and all kinds of 3D animation. So in my show reel you're just watching, um, you see several shots for um, several broadcasting channels or for even uh, also industrial clients, um, visualizing industrial processes or products. And it's a, quite a variety of topics uh, I packed in the actual showreel 2023. So hopefully this is uh, somehow appealing to some of you. And we see some of the stuff... Um, it is to me, later. by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Jonas. And yeah, we will um, have a look at some of these materials shown there um, in just a minute. All right. So, yeah, um, you tell me when uh, you're ready to share your screen and then we can dive I'm ready when it. you are. I am ready. I'm going to share your screen now. Cool. Be Very ready. Cool. There you go. You have the screen. And Thanks so much, Jonas. So, here. welcome again to this Ask the Trainer session. My name is Mark. Um, today we're going to talk about um, procedural shading, procedural uh, texturing and we know two kinds of texturing of applying surface qualities to object surfaces. Um, the first one is the good old um, texturing with bitmap textures with pixel based images and with that approach you have a very a fast approach to realism but on the other side you're resolution depending so you can't uh, zoom onto the object uh, infinitely without uh, hitting some pixels um, and, or, or maybe compression artifacts as well. And on the other hand, 
um, we have the procedural approach, which I'm talking about today. And the procedural approach is basically a rule-based texturing, texturing with math. In school, I hated math, but in Cinema 4D and Redshift especially, we have the possibilities to get something creative out of math and um, to mimic rules of the physical environment, of the physical reality out there. And that is the approach we're talking today. Um, the advantage of procedural shading is that it is rule-based and not resolution-depending, such as it is with um, pixel-based imagery. Um, the other downside maybe is it's more labor intensive because you have to put some more work into it to make it pop and be realistic and perhaps even photorealistic. So that is the two approach concept of um, texturing we have as CG artists. And let me quickly show you something um, <clears throat> about procedural texturing. When we do procedural shading, um, we are dealing in a great deal with Maxon noise shaders. We are dealing with gradients. We are dealing with layering stuff. We are dealing with functions, detecting normals, detecting axis directions. And all of this is, last but not least, mimicking rules out there in physical reality. So if you go out there and <laughs> step away from your computer from virtual reality, go out in the physical reality and have a look outside in what? nature. <laughs> you're, you're confronted with tons of um, yeah, basic procedural <laughs> approaches of, of, of um, object services because um, reality itself is procedural by, by the uh, uh, laws of physics, by the laws of nature. And if you take a look outside, such as at mountains, at rocks, at water surfaces, at clouds, everywhere you look, there are noises, noise functions, basically. And um, that is, as well, the first approach, the first step of the shading workflow. You go out there and you do observe. You analyze with your eyes. That's the first step of your shading workflow. It's the observation of nature. And the second step is, <laughs> the second step is <clears throat> you do have to transfer. So once you've seen um, uh, patterns in nature that look interesting to you, the next step would be to transfer that, oh, how could I recreate that in, in Cinema 4D or in Redshift for Cinema 4D especially? And then, most, not most, but a very important step is already done. So what we're talking about today are some uh, examples of procedural shading. Here we have a juicy, crispy apple. And that will be the first um, example I will show to you guys um, how to approach a texture of an apple, of a natural object, completely procedural based, uh, without any pixel textures. And the next example will be um, how to achieve something more complex like, like asphalt, like cracks, like uh, a curb stone, like a gutter stone, and something like that. So these are the topics of today. And in so between, we will have a look at procedural water as well. But that's for now, so we can jump right in. Just to interrupt you uh, quickly, so what we are seeing right now are reference images, right? So these are yes. photographs because when you yes. do something, when you shade something, you never know if it's if that's a photo or if that's a rendering. Um, <laughs> Thanks for flowers. <laughs> uh, but, um, um, uh, another thing that I just wanted to to say uh, to the audience, Ellie already wrote it uh, in the chats. If you have questions, please um, start the questions with a capitalized Q or capitalized question so that, that will make uh, things easier for us in the background. Uh, thank you. Okay, so as I explained, the first step of the shading workflow, the procedural shading workflow and shading in general, no matter if you do it with pixels or with procedural things, is observation, analysis with your eyes. And for that you have to take reference photos. And I took that photo today in my kitchen of an apple and 
we can now rest our eyes on this object and maybe do some analysis. So what do we actually see here? So let's focus first on the, on the uh, color content we're seeing here. Basically, all the structures we're seeing here in that apple are, um, let's say, polarized between two colors, a yellowish green and an orangish red. Let's say that way. And all the structures that are visible are more or less created by um, a gradient between both. So that is our task to create structures that are masking, and that's the transfer, that are masking colors. So we will now create and layer noises and gradients to mask a green or a red. Let's jump right into it. So here we have the render view of Redshift and we, we have the final apple. Let me just check if everything is all right in here. Um, we have as a basic ingredients here, the standard material node, of course, plugged into the output node. And let me just give me some more room here. And as you know, <clears throat> Clicking on a node will show all its attributes in the attribute manager. So everything interesting will go on here. So let's have a first look in the standard material node. And as you can see, there's nothing fancy going on here. It's just a Lambert, um, Lambert BSDF, Lambert Diffuse Roughness. So ideal for crispy, uh, for, not for crispy, for shiny, uh, slick surfaces. And uh, we have a quite some roughness going on in reflection terms. And for now, that's it. We don't have any subsurface scattering going on. We don't have a transmission. Everything is just on the surface of this apple. And I will explain why we don't have subsurface scattering in this special case a little later. So. Let me bring up the node tree. Let me um, just <clears throat> make this node window a little bigger so we can have an overview over our node tree. And what might seem a little complex is just, let's say, a sum of very simple elements. And in the end, they sum up to something more diverse and more rich than the sum of its elements. So. The elements themselves are really simple. So let's have a look at the first element. We have a color layer node here. That's our master, our central node here. The color layer node is plugged into the standard material node. That's responsible for everything in terms of diffuse shading. And we just have some bump mapping going on, but that's for in just a second. That's not interesting at the moment, so I will disconnect it and get back to the color layer node. And I will for now deactivate every um, layer in here. We have seven layers and I will deactivate everything except for layer one. So here we are. So the base layer is just a greenish color. <clears throat> Pardon me. And on top, we have that layer one. And what's going on in layer one? In layer one, we have something that's giving our apple a basic structure. Let me solo this ingredients in layer one of the master color layer. And this ingredients is again a color layer. Why is that? Because as a first ingredients in color layer one, I'd like to have combination of structures and I'd like to create something that's masking a color in my layer one. So layer one is, as you see, there's a reddish color and inside the mask part, there's something going on being plugged in and we will have a look what's going on there. So let me solo this no node and what you see is basically 
a very large scale Perlin noise. You know that that's the default noise. It's technically it's called a Perlin noise, but in Cinema 4D and Redshift, it's just called a noise. So that's a Perlin noise, the most simple noise possible. And by the way, the oldest noise in computer graphics history, but that's for another video. So we have that large scale um, Perlin noise here, large scale only in relation to the object because um, the overall scale is quite tiny, but we can, we can change that. Let me just um, pull the, um, the slider here and change that a bit. And you can see um, it's scaling accordingly. So let me just put in a little more contrast so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so that's my very basic ingredients. It's just a Perlin noise. And on top of the Perlin noise, we have something more going on. We have that tiny little um, FBM noise. That's basically, um, it's basically a noise like the Perlin noise, but with more octaves, basically spoken. And that noise is masked by another noise, which is called a Naki. You see? So if we um, solo the results so far, we have that basic Perlin noise. We have that tiny FPM noise masked by a Naki. And on top, almost superfluous, but we did it. Um, there's a wavy turbulence noise. So the result looks like this. And I use this result to mask my reddish color in the master color you note. So let's do this. And it looks like this. There you see all the amazing. ingredients. There see, thank you. you. See all the ingredients. And so far, let me recap this. It's just three noises. One, two, three. And the second one is masked by another noise. So that's the basic structure for giving this apple a very basic structure. And for now, that's only the first step, but if you're lazy, you could be finished by now. I'm, I mean, that's not close up, really cl ready for close up maybe, but for um, a medium distance, okay, we have an apple. So that totally works. If you, yeah. if, if, if you wanna adjust that tiny bit, you just go to the basic Perlin noise maybe play with um, the clipping or uh, the high clipping and just play a little bit with all those sliders here for clipping, meaning, yeah, contrast clipping. And yeah, that's basically it. And if your client or yourself have the wish um, for a completely different structure, you just spin the Wheel of Fortune, which is covered here, seat, brrr, and you create a completely different texture. Is that easy? Yeah, that's, so that's cool. It, it well because it's so procedural. It's also yes. um, It's also um, worth thinking about uh, this as um, like a tool for motion graphics. If you just need a texture to be animated over an apple, I mean, in most cases, this will look a little bit weird. But if you use it on purpose, um, th this could be totally cool. Yeah, just by bringing up the animation speed. Yeah. Um, and uh, no, it's 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 not fast enough. But but you could do this, of course. Yeah, uh, you could do and you could animate any of this. Easily. I already have a question for you, Mark. Animation speed. Yeah, please. Um, so, how do you decide which noises to pick and uh, when to yeah. to to add yeah. them, to multiply them, to to overlay them? Is it always a trial and error, or yeah. I mean, you have a lot that's, of experience now. Um, that's the question, the very central question, because we have that overwhelming no, not that uh, that overwhelming. Um, variety of noise shaders here. Each one is, a, let's say, a masterpiece in flexibility and structures and detail. And you really can go deep into every single parameter. But the central question is, okay, for central, um, 
for, for central structures, do I need a noise or an OBA, PETSO, POXO, ZEMA, whatever? And there lies a problem to my mind, because when these um, shaders were invented back in, I think, 2000 for a plug-in at that time for Cinema 4D Release 5, um, the creator of those noises, uh, David Patrick Farmer, um, told uh, decided to use let's say um synesthetic names so <laughs> the names of all those noises are as they would sound like by watching them okay oh that's Very weird but not helpful <laughs> fantasy names of, of course yeah. so that's <laughs> and that's the problem to you have to get a, a structure into your uh, workflow in order to find the usual suspects for structures and um, you have to go a little bit deeper into the topic of noises to get a structure for yourself and there are there is a hidden structure be behind noise shaders for an example um, the uh, default noise Perlin is nothing else but a turbulence noise with just one octave okay so let me solo that Perlin noise for a moment and show what I'm what I mean um, let me go into the noise and uh, let me just no no cycles please so okay so here we have um, a turbulence noise and let me lower the octaves of the turbulence and it looks like this keep that in your memory for now because I'm now switching to the Perlin noise and if I fiddle around a little bit with the, with, the, with the clipping, you see it's exactly the same. So there is a relationship, obviously, between noise and turbulence. And that is the octaves. Turbulence is nothing else than a Perlin noise with more octaves. So that is one of the hidden structures behind noise shaders. But to reveal all the magic and systematic behind behind the noise shaders is definitely another topic for another session um yeah it's huge because you can go very deep into this and you have to um uh, dig yourself into it a little bit more so what what to 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 put it in a nutshell for the for the question which one to choose there are several usual suspects for natural structures so for um, less defined general structures, you choose maybe um, a Perlin noise or for something that's more wavy or more, um, more in, the, in, the, uh, in the direction of clouds or maybe rocks or maybe veins, you choose maybe a Naki. And so from there you can go on. Everything that should be cell-like is definitely a job for Voronoi noise. But as I said, this is a very uh, a very detailed topic. We should talk about this in a different session. Absolutely, yeah. Hopefully that gave you a glimpse of what to choose from your noises. Yeah, basically it's a little bit of trial and error. You first have to get familiar with the noises, yeah. then also um, use a layer node, just play with the play with the um, with the modes and um, even just by layering up two noises, you can get so much out of um, yeah, out of these two. It's um, it's really surprising in a very yeah. positive way. To get comfortable with with a, a use of noises, it's a little bit like learning a language. You have to get uh, um, comfortable with all those uh, terms here, and you should have a picture in mind. Ah, Sima looks like this. Ah, Naki looks like this. I could use this. So, literally, there's no way around that. So, yeah. that if you have a printer, happen. print all the noises. Yes, yes. Okay. So that was the first ingredients here, and having a look at an apple like this um, you see that there are more structures going on here let's have a look back at the reference and what do we have as a next layer here um, let me just add something simple to relax a little bit so i activate layer two in the master color layer node and in layer two 
I have something going on that's looking like this. It's a very tiny um, turbulence noise. And this turbulence noise is also masking a color in layer two. And it's again that reddish color. And it's looking like, let me zoom in like this. So let me deactivate it and activate it. And you see it's adding another level of grainy detail here. So we have something next here. In layer three, we have some streaks. It's just um, a vertically stretched noise masking a reddish color. And in the next layer, there are some tiny little dots. Let me introduce you to tiny little dots in layer four. It's That's a Voronoi. Just... Yes, sir, a Voronoi <laughs> three. A Voronoi three looking like this when soloed. So there's obviously um, a low brightness and some clipping going on here. And when we zoom in there, it's just looking like, yeah, tiny dots basically. And that, that's what it is, a tiny dot being plugged into layer four of the color layer node and drum roll as well in a ramp. And last but not least in a bump map, but that's for a little later. So desolo it and look what's looking like. So tiny little dots, ladies and gentlemen. The next layer are in layer five are some greenish streaks. And these greenish vertical streaks are nothing else than an FPM noise vertically stretched this time in the UV space of the apple. So we can go from pole to pole. So until now we have applied the noises in the 3D space in object. So related to volumetrically related to the object. And this time we have applied the noise in a vertically stretched version in the UV space. So we can relate to the poles and get that, um, that a tapering structure here on top of the apple and at the bottom as well. So this is masked again or overlaid by something. Let me show you this because as soon as we're dealing with UVs, we get some seams. Sadly, let me, let me check if we can see them. Uh, where are they? Let me just check this. Here we go. Oh, I... Okay. So, here are some seams going on. Luckily, you don't see them too much, but if you navigate down to the bottom, let me just deactivate the bokeh here. So, okay. You see them yeah, quite can clearly. See so there's a seam going on. That's because we are applying the noise in UV space. And how do we circumnavigate that? Well, personally, I don't like UVs. And <laughs> I, I circumnavigate when, them whenever I can. Oh, Mark, you should definitely watch this month's uh, demystifying post-production series yes. then because we're talking about UVs at the moment. <laughs> okay. You will love okay. them afterwards. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> I doubt that, but okay. <laughs> okay, so what do we do here? Um, I somehow have to mask this uh, seam here. And I do this by just creating a ramp node. A ramp node is nothing else but the color gradient. And I adjust it in that way that it is... Um, dark at both ends. So it's looking like that. And when combined with the noise inside a color composite node, 
it looks like this. That might look a little harsh, so I will um, go a little back and forth and add some noise maybe. And by that, I add some kind of a masking for my uh, contributing noise. So how does this look like? Because we are still contributing to the master color layer. And we're here in layer five. And we desolo that and look what this is looking like. And as you can see, I created this, just to remember that, for creating greenish vertical streaks. And as you can see, there's nothing visible that looks like a seam. So combined with all the recent structures we just created, that, um, that cosmetics worked. So absolutely in layer fantastic. Five. And it's super clever to to mask that off with a uh, with a gradient that has some noise in it. Yeah, because yeah. Maybe more or less it's a dirty trick, let's be honest. But with all the other structures recently added, it, it doesn't matter anyhow. So they're the best kind of tricks. Yeah. <laughs> they're my favorite ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It works. And who cares, by the way? So um then we have two layers left. Let's look what's in there. Layer six, ladies and gentlemen, is a ramp. And this ramp is looking like this. It's just a basic color ramp, nothing fancy, from um, a reddish tone at the bottom to a yellow-greenish tone at the top. And this is fed into color layer six, uh, into the color pot of layer six, and it's masked, obviously. And the interest, that's the interesting part. How does the mask work? And the mask is looking like this. This is masking our color gradient. And as you can see, this is done by two components. We have a ramp. That ramp is applied obviously in UV space because all, by definition, all, um, ramp nodes in Redshift are working in 2D space. And for 3D gradients, you have to find a workaround, which is existing. I will show it in my next YouTube videos. But this is a 2D ramp. And it's working with some kind of uh, uh, noise here, just to break up the edges a little bit, make them less clean. And on top, there's some maxo noise going on. Doesn't care. If there are seams here because it's just um, burnt blend mode burn. I love that burn blend mode um, over the um, over the ramp, and that's it. Some color correction going on. Minor color correction. Uh, obviously, no color correction. Let's get rid of that, and that's the mask for color layer six. So this is layer uh, masking our gradient in layer six. And that's the structure here on top. Let me just zoom into it and refer yes. to, the, um, to the original reference. And it's just, yeah, it's OK for now. It's looking cool. Absolutely. What, what so does we the have bottom one layer like? left. Pardon me? What does the bottom look like? Because you, you did that to the top and the bottom, right? Yes. The bottom is looking like so. There's not too much rocket science going on at the bottom mm -hmm. because um, Apple will stand on it anyway. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just looking quite simple. Okay, one layer left. And this layer adds some kind of realism because if you buy an apple, it's never perfect. It's not like in fairy tales where there are perfect apples. They all have some damages, some splotches, some punches going on, some imperfections. 
and um, <clears throat> we have to take care of that. So what do we do? Let me just have a look. Okay, layer seven, there's a mask going on in layer seven for a color that is like this, a tiny beige, light beige, but it's since it's multiplied, it is creating that um, tiny damages here. You see that? All those um, random looking damages making you regret to have bought it, to buy this apple, maybe. But um, this is adding, of course, a touch of realism. So how is it? How is this done? Um, we have a little color layer node going on here. And the basic structure here is a maxon noise again. And this maxon noise is this time, let's see, a SEMA noise. And the SEMA noise is something like a spaghetti noise or let's say a fake caustics, water caustics uh, structure. So that's the SEMA noise. By the way, um, there's a, uh, th there are relatives to the SEMA noise um, with, with similar sounding names. It's the Hama noise. Where is it? Hama and also Sada. They're relatives, maybe siblings or <clears throat> brothers and sisters. I don't know. But for now, we stick with the Sima noise. So, and, and we could write a, noise... um, a book about uh, family rela uh, relationships of noises. Yes. I think that doesn't exist yet, right? Pardon? That doesn't exist yet, I think. <laughs> a relationship of noises just does exist. I, I meant family all... relationships, but <laughs> I don't know. But but there are some structural relationships, of course. Yes, definitely. So, if you um, have a book recommendation, let us know. I have a YouTube channel recommendation. Oh. YouTube.com/slash/renderbaron. Oh, because yeah. in one of my upcoming videos, I will uh, have a deep dive into the hidden beauty and structure of noise shaders. We talked about that. Okay, so that's the SEMA noise, but the SEMA noise is too slick, too soft. It's uh, it's too it's look it looks too artificial to create damages on an apple. So how do we do something about that? We take care of that by adding another structure to it. In this case, a Perlin noise, and we plug that Perlin noise into the input and then offset. And that is creating an offset of all those structures based on the uh, brightness or the grayscale information of this maxon noise. So with the white color or with the second color, I can control the amount of offset of distortion, basically. So with the bright white, I have an insane amount of um, offset here of distortion, and by lowering it down to a dark gray, almost black, I get a reasonable amount of offset here. And in the next step, I will overlay this structure with a high contrast turbulence noise, which is just um, with a, um, manipulated with a high clipping with a high, uh, with a, with, a, with a strong clipping value, so I use that as a mask, and it looks like this. So I have um, this offset at SEMA noise now, just uh, looking through the let's say holes of the former mentioned um, turbulence noise, and on top, again, um, a Voronoi noise, Voronoi one. Um, in this case, it's just added with a screen blend mode, and that's it. That these are this is the mask for creating um, imperfections, and then this is plugged into the mask of layer seven. And in layer seven, as we know, there is this beige multiplied on top, and if I desolo everything, we see the structures this is creating. See that? Little yeah. uglinesses, if you if that's a term. <laughs> some splotches, some damages. But anyway, a touch of realism, an extra touch of realism. So um, 
I don't want to go into too much detail. So there's a little more going on in terms of bump mapping here. Um, so we have um, a good amount of realism here. Let me plug this into uh, the bump um, port here of the standard material node. And as you can see, um, the structures for the damages are also plugged into um, a layer shader being plugged into the bump node. So we have now made ourselves an apple and I just <laughs> shifted it. Okay. So, and the cool thing about all of this is, let me just revert to the saved version to get the correct camera angle. The cool thing about all of this is, this is absolutely close up ready, even ultra close up. You won't ever see a single pixel and you can go there as close as you want. Let me just um, do a little less bouquet. So, and that's the magic of um, yeah, procedural shading because you're completely independent of pixel textures and you can make yourself a brand new Apple texture with every click on the seed parameter. I totally love it. I totally love it. Um, so what you're showing right now with going closely is um, yeah, exactly the, the main advantage or one of the main advantages mm -hmm. um, of procedural shading. And now um, let's just say you you do like a, an animation about a fly or so and your camera yeah. is going through yeah. the kitchen. Like the camera yeah. is in the kitchen uh, doing like a a wide shot and then suddenly you dolly in to that apple and you don't have to to uh, dynamically reload textures to to make it not um yeah break but you can go as close as possible do the macro shot of a, of the fly or any other insect and uh, the apple will just the, yes. the material will just yeah support. and i can e i can even animate material aspects such as yes. maybe i can um raise um, this, the overall scale of the damage mask and just by doing so and we instantly we have more damage going on here until a totally scratched or uh, even um, yeah, aged uh, apple so that's not looking juicy <laughs> anymore that's looking uh, yeah, kind of weird and what I want to tell you is just we can animate all of this and um, that's a real advantage. Yes, absolutely. So one thing about this, one last thing about this apple is uh, impo definitely important. Um, as we're dealing with fruits, we're of course dealing with a certain amount of subsurface gathering. And if you have a closer look here at the standard material node where all of this comes together, you will see that there isn't subsurface scattering on. Why is that? Because apple, apples are one of the fruits that don't have an extensive amount of um, subsurface scattering to them. It's a completely different thing with, let's say, tangerines or oranges, but apples behave more like maybe wood, I don't know, with a very tiny amount of um, subsurface scattering. And let me show you something. If I plug all of the diffuse color information inside the subsurface color port and I turn the weight of diffuse shading of base color weight down to zero and I raise the weight of subsurface scattering, what do you see? There's something very interesting going on because Obviously, okay, wow, we, we just have subsurface scattering, but obviously we have kind of diffuse shading going on as well. And that's correct because the formula for subsurface scattering, a very boring term called BSSRDF, um, has a component of diffuse shading in it. So if you're using subsurface scattering to an extensive amount, you're 
should only go with plugging all the color information into the subsurface color port and turn down the diffuse shading in the base color port because it's superfluous for now. And what you're also witnessing now is that rendering is, of course, more expensive because all of the diffuse information, all of this is calculated by subsurface scattering. But as we don't need that much subsurface scattering with an apple, we can just go with a base color port, go back to one, turn down subsurface scattering, and nobody cares. It's just exactly the almost the same looking. And it's so much faster. Look at that. It's just, it's almost at 50% uh, right now. So that's just one thing. If, you, if you're using subsurface scattering to an extensive amount, turn down diffuse shading, or if you don't need it that much, just go with base uh, color and diffuse shading. So for now, that's the Apple part of the story. So yeah, well, what we learned already um, is, um, yeah, play with the noises, play with, um, with the noise types, with the noise scale. Um, make some or do some experiments with um, masking them using a layer shader or um, yeah with the with the layer um, blend modes and you will already uh, get quite far. Yeah. So it's That's, uh, it's really cool yeah, and the definitely. more you layer it up, um, it's it's really funny how you or not funny but uh, interesting how you analyze the 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 structure of that um, apple skin and uh, yeah just turned it down into all of these ingredients as you said and yeah, that's the first part yeah splitting it up splitting up splitting it up into logical uh, parts yeah yeah so yeah, yeah it, it takes some practice to to get there um definitely. but it's definitely worth it it's yeah. definitely worth it and it's fun i love to do things procedurally it's just my passion yeah it's it's also a little bit of a challenge so yes whenever definitely. you want to challenge yourself that's the interesting um, part of it yeah then uh, just pick a material and try to reproduce it procedurally. Yeah. Not an apple because you now know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some more ex um, examples with me. Um, I always wanted to do a procedural asphalt shader. So there are so many client projects or free projects or animation projects in general, general where I needed an asphalt shader independently from, ah, oh, there's a curve, ah, oh, there has to be a patch or oh, a repair um, area maybe. And I always hated to, to, oh, come on, where do I get the correct texture for that? Okay, I have to photograph it, repaint it. I just wanted to do it procedurally. So that was my goal for so long. And finally, I did it. So <laughs> um, before we look at that, um, we have the analysis part. We have some street photography here taken in my surroundings. And we just keep an eye on it and look how cracks look like here in that paint on the street. They do remind me on a Voronoi 3 noise here, if you ask me, maybe overlaid, overlaid by another noise, maybe a little offset it by a tiny noise, so a little uh, distort, disturbed, distorted. And the other things you see on the streets are lots and lots of tiny little um, granular details going on. You have so much, um, tiny gravel here inside, glued inside on, on the asphalt side, glued inside a bitumen, a tar bitumen. Um, that's how asphalt is made. It's just gravel glued together by tar. And that's how asphalt is made. And it's made out of just tiny little gravel parts. And all of this is also reminding me of Voronoi noises in Cinema 4D or on Redshift. And there's something else going on here. If you see that um, curbstone, you see that it's, it seems to be used heavily on its edges. And 
that's the analysis part. And the transfer part would be how do we create that um, that worn edges effect on objects. And we have uh, a tool inside Cinema 4D, uh, which is called the uh, Redshift, which is called the Curvature Shader, and as well the Ambient Occlusion Shader. I will come to that in just a moment. And here we have another close-up look on yeah, me standing on asphalt. And this is so clear now that the basis for asphalt must be a layered product of several Voronoi noises. So this is this might be a good basis to start with. So yeah, and that's also very interesting. These are you know, you, you have to know, German streets are never perfect. <laughs> German streets are uh, repaired over and over again, over decades. They're repaired and repaired again. And there are several parts being taken out of the asphalt, and there's uh, uh, they're, they are repaired again, and there are seams with, uh, with a glue seam onto it, and there are several materials layered on top of each other. And as you can see in that image, some materials do have a more rough reflection and others do have a less rough reflection, such as the seams here. They do have a little, a little sharper reflection than the asphalt, which is used for the last 50 years maybe. So before we jump into that, quite complex shader. Let me show you, um, hopefully, a simple example for the curvature shader and the aforementioned ambient occlusion shader. So what we have here is something completely different, but it's a nice example, maybe a workbench, for showing you these shader nodes. So I will deactivate the render view for now and show you what I have here by Showing you this animation, we have some kind of an ocean surface here going on. And sadly, the deformation here has nothing to do with redshift. It's just um, noises from the classic material system used inside a displaced um, deformer. I will just show you a tiny bit of that so you understand the structure of the project. So we have a plane here, that plane is high resolution, as you can see. And, <clears throat> pardon, the plane has uh, a, a this, this how, how is it called? Displaced deformer, this displacer. And the displacer is set to 150 centimeters intensity. And it's, it's just carrying a noise shader, a noise shader with animation speed one. And that's it. It's just that simple. Just that wavy, large scale, um, um, animation and uh, movement going on here. So then I added another displacer beneath it because um, the formers are, um, are calculated from top to bottom in the object manager. So my next displaced deformer here carries just two noises for all the detail going on here. Just a glimpse behind the scenes. We have a layer shader here. Inside the layer shader, we have uh, displaced Voronoi, and on top some, um, what is it, wavy turbulence going on in my favorite mode, burn. And <laughs> that's creating all those um, um, wavy structures here. And all of that has um, an animation speed to it. There's no single, not a single keyframe going on here. It's just animation speed for three noises. And why am, t am I telling you this? Because um, this is obviously not redshift related be, um, because the displacer sadly cannot connect to all the cool redshift shaders for now, hopefully, and it just relates to the classic material system. So that means that the classic, the noises in the classic material system and the layer shader and noises of the classic material system. But this has something to do with the shading in Redshift, I'm going to show you. So let's get back to frame one. <clears throat> Clear the frame buffer for now. Start render view again, make it a little bigger so we have a little more space 
to look at. And what I want to tell you is about the curvature node and the ambient occlusion node. So I have my node window here. Let's um, adjust the size a little bit. And as you can see, that's not too fancy what's going on here. We have um, some col a color layer node again with just basically four, no, three ingredients this here, just three layers. I will zoom in a little bit. And that's the whole magic behind that basic ocean stuff. It, um, it's just a workbench to show you some uh, nodes we, are, we, we will work with in the asphalt shaders. So, okay, the color layer node contains of a basic color. Basic color looking so, very boring. And there's a layer one screened, blend mode screen on it. And let's look how this is working. So that's the first interesting ingredients. There we have ambient occlusion. And I will I will just uh, show you that one. Okay, what's going on here? We have ambient occlusion plugged into a ramp node. So I remapped the ambient occlusion with a bluish to black color gradient. And the result is just looking like this. I did nothing else. All these structures going on here, what you can see now is just from ambient occlusion being remapped by a blue to black gradient. And all the structure that is created here is coming from the deformers here. So you can see it's it looks much more boring with just the Perlin noise large scale displacer. And it looks much more interesting with all those tiny deformation stuff going on here. So how does this work? Well, Ambient occlusion is a shader. Um, it's already also in the classic material system. A shader that is sampling where an object gets occluded by other objects. So, ambient occlusion is looking into the direction of the polygon normal and sampling in a hemispherical manner um, if it gets occluded by another um, object. So that's what what it does natively, but we can do some magic with ambient occlusion and the function invert normal. And invert normal does yeah, it, it's it's it does basically the opposite. It doesn't look at the in the direction of the polygon normal. It looks at the opposite direction. Where do I include myself, or where am I included from? Uh, from the back. So that's the invert normal function of ambient occlusion. So in this case, ambient occlusion just looks where do I occlude myself, maybe in terms of spikes of a wave. And that's how these structures are created here. Now you might ask, wait a minute, Mark, you're using ambient occlusion with invert normals, but don't we have a much sophisticated, much more sophisticated um, Shader node, yes, we do have that. We do have a curvature node. And the curvature node is basically, uh, let me let me just remap that. Okay, yeah, looking good. Um, the, the, the curvature node is basically uh, si somehow similar, somehow related to the ambient occlusion technique because it also samples uh, maybe in a convex or concave way. But it's, but it's more sophisticated when detecting when it comes to detecting um, curvature uh, or roundings of um, object surfaces. So both are related somehow, ambient occlusion and curvature. Curvature is more defined when it comes to curvature, as the name says. But ambient occlusion is more sophisticated when it comes to uh, yeah, fiddling around with it and... Uh, um, manipulating spread, fall off, and maximum distance, whatnot. You don't have these parameters with curvature, but in curvature, you do have a very defined result. One thing to know about ambient occlusion being remapped, one important thing is it might be that the result is looking differently. 
depending on if you're using progressive random mode or bucket random mode. Hopefully that's, let me, oh, yeah, it, it's more defined. It's stronger, definitely, but it's not completely different. But keep in mind that there's a difference between a remapped ambient occlusion in progressive mode and in bucket random mode. That's because of the random physics behind going on behind the scenes. Not interested in that. It's just the difference between both random modes. Just keep that in mind. So we have that both ingredients. In layer one, we have that inverted normals ambient occlusion. In layer two, we have that curvature node. Let me just um, uh, turn it on. And it's looking like drum roll this okay i've just soloed my master call you know that obviously things get masked here let me just tell you about this just a little bit um the ambient occlusion remapped ambient occlusion gets masked by that large scale and um, what is it i think it's a poxo yeah a poxo noise um with an overall scale of gigantic 80 whatever that means, but it's creating that um, foam-like structures maybe, um, or, or turbulent water structures maybe. You could play with um, the, the clipping, maybe invert that with the clipping values. So create a completely different structure maybe. Um, but I found that um, doing it the opposite way creates a more pleasing um, result. So what do we have next? So that's the mask for the rem remapped ambient occlusion. And we have also a map, a, a mask, excuse me, for the remapped curvature. And that's looking like this. It's just a tiny, I guess, an FPM. Yeah, FPM noise masking our curvature node. And it's looking like this. Let us have a look at the final result we have that remapped ambient occlusion we have that curvature both of them are mapped with <clears throat> somehow remapped or not remapped um, noises and that's it that's the completely that's the full um, story behind the diffuse shading here and I plucked both of that inside um, not, not both of that I plucked it both into the base color node and additionally, in the, inside the subsurface color node. Normally, I wouldn't do that because I, I explained it to you, the diffuse component of uh, subsurface scattering and so on. But in this case, I just had the artistic need to do so, and it looks quite nice. And I also chose um, a quite, yeah, let's say vintage um, <laughs> style of, um, subsurface scattering. Normally, we do have that fantastic random walk mode. Um, but in this case, I think the look is just too soft, too friendly, maybe. It's more like a fairy tale water here. And yeah, let's go a little harsher. So I chose to do the good old ray trace diffusion uh, style of um, subsurface scattering here, and it give, it's giving me that a little more harsh, not too defined look I was looking for. And on top, there's a little um, bump mapping going on. Not too, nothing too fancy. Just I think it's a wavy turbulence. No, it's a naki noise, and that's it. So that's my um, more or less basic ocean shader going on. But it's only a workbench to show you ambient occlusion with inverted normals direction and curvature for now. So, are there any questions until now? Because now we're entering Pandora's box. <laughs> um, all right, um, let, me, let me see. So I have one um, uh, comment here. I just wanna show it because Ilda is a huge fan of Render Baron, he wrote. So, Kudos to you, Mark. <laughs> we have oh, we have a few questions. Um, um, so far, they were not related to the noise setups that you showed. One was um, how to create physically correct um, a diamond. Oh, um, 
I would say that we that we can cover that in one of the next sessions. So yes. I, I would love the questions to be more um, yeah, related to what Mark is showing. Uh, that will make it easier also later uh, if you want to rewatch that everything uh, in here is based on procedural um, shading. And well, a diamond would also be a procedural shading, but in this case, um, to stick to what Mark is showing. Um, yeah. All the other questions so far are really questions I would uh, I would do in a separate session, actually. Okay, cool. So um, we will switch now to um, something more complex. And I will give you um, an impression of a shader I recently created. It's that asphalt shader. And um, as I already explained, I always wanted to do something like that because I was just tired of texture painting every time I used, uh, I needed, uh, well, I had the need for a new um, asphalt shader. So I wanted to do it procedurally, desperately more or less. And this time I succeeded. And yeah, that's the good old German asphalt with all those uh, dirty uh, thrown away chewing gums, all those cracks, all those patches, all those glued seams. And uh, yeah, it's um, basically um, close up ready. So you can zoom in there to all those gooey chewing gums on the floor. And yeah, maybe to that level and if you close, if you go closer, <laughs> the magic breaks, and all of that Voronoi stuff is revealed because that's what it is. It's a bunch of Voronoi shaders um, as a basis, of course. And I will just take you on a little trip into that. Um, yeah, to be honest, complex shader. But uh, I'm also here to take. Uh, to take the maybe the pain away of complex shader setups because everything is just made of simple ingredients mixed together. So I've prepared um, a very um, basic version of that um, asphalt shader. Let me just bring that up. Um, it's looking like so. So let's just have a look at the complete shader to get a little anxious. And uh, yeah, that's it, my friends. It's, um, yeah, complex. But as you can see, you can deal with complex shaders if you tidy up things. You do have to make a structure inside the node tree to find your way through it. So to navigate through all the ingredients, you have to be extremely um, uh, precise about this, the visual structure of your node tree. So what we have here are several layers of ingredients. And the first ingredient is that area above. All of it is um, being, let's say, merged into a master color layer node. We won't go through every detail, it would just take too long, but um, I will show you just on the, the magic behind those um, complex shaders lies in its simplicity, in the simplicity of its uh, ingredients. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's have a look here. So we have that master color layer, all right? And of course we have a color layer as um, melting point for the first ingredients. And the first ingredients are just a bunch of Voronoi noises. And in this case, let me just solo it, it's just a Voronoi 3 noise. As you can see, let me just bring that up a little bit. And Voronoi noises in Redshift have the specialty compared to the classic material system that you have a certain parameter that helps with varying Voronoi structures to a more um, diverse um, 
appearance. So, and that's the exponent. The exponent is a parameter that allows you to somehow deflate or inflate Voronoi structures. Please keep in mind, the exponent parameter only applies to um, Voronoi uh, 1, 2, 3 and displaced Voronoi. That's it. But uh, for these, the exponent is a blessing because you can com uh, create completely new structures. Okay, so what does this mean? Lowering the exponent means basically deflating structures. Let me just zoom in a little more. And raising the exponent means literally to inflate structures of the Voronoi noise. And that gives a Voronoi noise a completely different appearance. So if we deflate, so the, 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 the default value is 2.1. And if we go below this exponent, this default exponent, we deflate structures. And if we go maybe at 1.2, you see now our aforementioned Voronoi suddenly has something more like a gravel. That's the very first ingredients for our uh, gravel structure. And what we need as well is some distortion. I already mentioned the possibility of distorting um, shaders with a noise shaders with the offset parameter to be found here. Where is it? Uh, offset, here we are. And if we plug in a very tiny noise looking so, it's I think it's a turbulence, yeah. Um, plug this into the input offset, then we get that, you see that, that distortion here. And we can control the amount of distortion by raising or lowering the brightness value of the controlling noise, in this case, that turbulence. Or we could do um, go into the white color and lower that in the direction of gray or dark, uh, uh, black. I prefer to do uh, the controlling with the brightness parameter because I, I just have one uh, dial, I one slider I have to, to use and that's it. Okay, so that's the offsetted noise with lower exponent and that's ramped into, yeah, a little more softer look and that's it. I did that with some more noises as you can see here, some more Voronoi noises and laid all of that together in side a layer shader node and i did that with five layers and it's looking like so and as you can see some voro noise i remap with a color in this this uh, case a beige others with a bluish tone and so on, a greenish tone maybe, to get a color variety for that gravel on the ground. And it's already looking okay for now. We don't have anything else here, but only layered Voronoi noises. And it's looking maybe like tar, maybe like asphalt already. So I think that's a good starting point. Yeah, what else do we have here? We have... Um, some more, some more large-scale structures going on. I will go over to the final result and explain it from there. Just a second. Where are we? Okay, here we are. Here we are with the noises. Just explained it so far. That's the first um, cluster. Of course, you could, speaking of clusters, of course, you could group those noises with Alt-G. 
whoa, but mm, then things happen and uh, they don't really, uh, that's not really helpful. I, I'd like to, I'd, <laughs> I'd rather like to go the way with a complicated noise setup, maybe with ungrouped noises, but everything is open for, for manipulation. Nothing is hidden. And um, if you tidy up things with a visual structure like this in, in your note tree, you can work with things like that. Okay, the next ingredients is uh, maybe let's 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 jump to a next cluster here. Um, I think that's maybe interesting. Yeah, um, that's a, a large scale structure here. Let's look what this is. It's basically um, it's basically a, a cell noise. A cell noise is just looking like. Let me just looking like this like 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 yeah maybe like like cubes or squares in uh, several gray scales and this is being offset as well and this is just creating um the um overall large scale structures of the asphalt so next up we have some uh, cracks going on i will just bring that up a little more so we have the bigger picture and this is the cracks shader here. So cracks are an important um, topic because that's something that's a little hard to do out of the box. But with the ingredients I just showed you so far, um, offsetting or distorting noises and something that's called cycles, we can create procedural cracks. And that's interesting. So let's have a look. We have that Voronoi 3, the usual suspect for cracks, Voronoi 3. I just showed you that that street pictures and the cracks on the painting on the street reminded me already of Voronoi 3. So the Voronoi 3 noise is obviously offset by a, a tiny little, I think, yeah, turbulence as well, the usual suspect. So it gives that nice um, um, offset, that, that nice distortion here, okay? And I think that's it for now. It's just a distortion of the Voronoi 3 noise. And then we have um, an overlying structure masking it inside a color layer node. And it's looking like so. The base color of that color layer node is white. The cracks are multiplied or, or, or normal or burnt over each other and it's creating this structure. And if you pipe this into a bump node, this will create a nice looking uh, crack bump effect. On top, we have some slight color going on here for the diffuse color. So what you can see so far is, even if it looks complicated, everything is made of certain, um, it, let's call it clusters. Another thing that I'm quite happy with is um, that patches you see on German streets all the time. This is the structure for it. And it's made basically of two Voronoi 1 noises. So the Voronoi 1 noise looks like this. And basically it's not looking like that. It looks like, <laughs> like tiny, tiny circles. But since I used a huge exponent here, I made boxes out of it. So that's what the exponent is good for, inflating structures, Voronoi structures. So that's the natural appearance of a Voronoi noise. Um, yeah, more or less splotches. Let me just relax the clipping a little bit so you get an idea. Okay, that's the natural um, appearance of a Voronoi noise, okay? And I just um, stretched it a little at the uh, in an unproportional way and raised the clipping to a very harsh result. And I raised the exponent to 10. And by that, I made 
squares out of circles. That's the exponent. It's inflating Voronoi structures. And by overlaying different Voronoi structures, Voronoi 1 structures, I get this. And the interesting thing about this structure... That is cool. I'm, uh, I'm blown away by that. Uh, so I would never have used it that way, but it, it totally makes sense. Um, yeah, it's the exponent. That's a little magic I was, I was always uh, thinking about how to create these structures on a street. Um, yeah. Now I know. And maybe Thank just you. cover one, one, one component of the street and then go into a question mode or experiment mode. Yeah. So that is not getting too complicated here. One thing I always wondered about um, street structures was how to create that glued seams at the edges of the repair patches. Let me go into the opposite direction with the camera and look directly, more or less directly, into um, the direction of light. So these um, glue structures here are obviously um, related to the patches, of course. And how do we create um, an outline from an existing black and white structure? Well, the basis to do so, the key that you cre can create an outline is that you have a structure that's not totally harsh, that has not a totally harsh black and white contrast. Because um, the outline is created by A remapping. And let me just check. Just a second. <laughs> I'll have to look at my own um, shader for that. Ah, there we are. OK. So here we have the uh, outlines. And the outlines are created by remapping a black, a soft black to white contrast, because within a black to white contrast, we have that areas that are not completely white or black. And that is where a gradient can remap something from black to white to black. And by that, we get a seam. It just looks like that. Just feed in any structure that has a soft black to white gradient that's not totally harsh because in the um, transfer area, you get grayscales. And that grayscales can be remapped to, um, to a gradient from black to white to black. Let me just check uh, where the ramp is actually. Uh, there we are. There we are. That's the ramp. So. Here we go. That is the structure I was talking about. Well, I just misnavigated just a second. That's the structure I was talking about, and it's being plugged into a ramp looking like this, black to white to black. And the result is looking so. And you can only do that if you have a soft, um, a soft transition between black and white here. So that's how the, the seams are created. Yeah, that's it. That's the, uh, the component I, would, I wanted to cover additionally. So, okay, overall, um, the asphalt structure looks like this. The seams are used to have a little sharper reflection. Um, and there are also tire tracks on the uh, on the road um, you see that with a little sharper reflection here more bluish coming from the sky um, or let me just um, go to uh, the feet here and you can see the lower the viewing angle of course the more reflection is going on and just as a as a point about the tire tracks uh, yeah, it's called here Reifenspuren. Let's call it tire tracks. <laughs> uh, it's just a, that a, a gradient like this um, being put 
on top of the uh, other shaders and creating, um, yeah, a tire tracks basically because there's rubber going on by countless um, uh, car tires and these leave a mark on the asphalt and this is resulting in a little sharper um, reflection on the asphalt. So yeah, to give it a bigger picture, that's the complete shader here. And uh, yeah, it's quite complex, but it's made out of medium complex components. And yeah, of course, yeah. this isn't something you wouldn't do in your first week with node materials. <laughs> Absolutely not. But uh, I can definitely see the value of it. We we had a, a comment uh, by Ilda in the chat. Um, he said, uh, just use an image instead. It's too complex for ordinary asphalt. Um, but um, I think it's... Um, so, of course, in many cases, you would you would use a texture, but there are also cases where um, there are advantages with something like that. A, mm -hmm. um, when I just talk of uh, yourselves um, progressing as artists, it's uh, the practice and uh, nerding out, but you don't get paid for that, of course. However, in a job uh, where you get paid, this might still save you hours and still give you the variation. Let's just think of a car that is um, yeah, just driving along one of these uh, um, streets with a procedural material on it. Um, you can you can make it drive like to infinity and you will never have the same structure on the street, for example, because yeah. the, the problem with textures is always that uh, they are repeating at some point. You have to tile them. And of course, there are tricks um, how you can break up the tiling a little bit, how you can still create some variation. But uh, you will never um, get to, to, to a variation that is um, the same as in a shader. Yeah, that's the motivation behind all of this. I'm preparing a quite complex um, car chase for a movie project. And I wanted to have a close-up ready um, um, street shader where I don't have to care about every single patch of asphalt or tar or bitumen or whatever. I, I just want to define some rules and that's working universally. That's it. And mm -hmm. that was my motiv motivation. Yeah. By the way, here you, in, in the curbstone, you can see the use of the curvature, um, the curvature node shader I recently talked about. Yeah. Oh, it's it's super great. How did you do the 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 tiles there? Is that just a um, a checkerboard shader? Yeah, or, or um, tiles. That, that, that's work tiles in progress. Shader? It's it's not mm -hmm. not uh, what I like right now. It's just a placeholder, basically. It's just a tile shader, the the, mm -hmm. the brand new tiles, more or less brand new tile shader, with some random colors. Let me check. Um, sidewalk. Let me call it sidewalk. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so let me check this. Um, yeah, there's also the Voronoi thing going on, and we have that tile shader. You just call it the Voronoi thing. The Voronoi thing going on, yes. <laughs> and here we have the tile shader. It's just, yeah, with randomized colors. That's the basic structure in square pattern mode and small uh, global scale. That's it for now. It's just work in progress. It's just, yeah more or less a, a placeholder for now. But it works. Yeah, pretty well. That's great. Let me let me check if there are some if some questions came in regarding this. I, I think that there are no questions. Most of the people might be just blown away um, <laughs> of what you can do with pro uh, procedural shaders. Because usually when you see something like um, like a street, you would always say, OK, or you would always think, um, I don't know how to do that procedurally, or it is not possible yeah. procedurally. But as you can see, yeah. it is. And yeah. Um, yeah, we already talked about the advantages that um, this uh, uh, the procedural shading um, is coming with, uh, be it yeah. close-ups, be it um, infinite tracks or streets or something. There are, there are a lot um, of these. So you, you can name a few more i guess but um yeah, yeah since w one of the question was about like paid jobs uh, mark also gets 
paid for his jobs, right? And still, he takes the time <laughs> to create. Twenty-two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you, you. This is something definitely to do in your R and D time, in research and yeah. development. I do use this uh, right now in the actual client's project, which will be published soon. But uh, the main motivation was to have that in my repository to use that whenever I like. So exactly. that's definitely R and D. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, because one thing you can do is you, you can just um, add it to your asset browser, for example, yes. and then you always have it there. You just um, search for it and then you have it. Yes. You can create yeah. a procedural wood, a procedural apple, procedural water, procedural um, rock, street, whatever, whatever comes yeah. um, to your mind. Um, all of the setups that you might use more often than once, just save them to the asset browser and yeah, um, well, the, the, yeah, the when you use them more than once, it's already worth it because yeah. the second time you use it, you are like, oh, I'm so glad that I did that. I once created a, a, a wood shader also on Ask the Trainer, and mm -hmm. I'm still using it for everything that is wood. Uh, for, mm -hmm. uh, for example, for motion graphics where I have, um, let's say, um, yeah, a volume modeling setup uh, where... where um, a noise is meshed, but the noise is also animated. I just put the put the procedural wood on it and it's looking great um with the texture this wouldn't work um, not even with um with a triplanar node for example yeah it wouldn't look yeah, as good it's especially the volumetric stuff of the noises that is so helpful without uh filling around with with uvs all the time and it's it's just a vol also a volumetric approach with doing noises in object or world mode hmm. so um as you mentioned with the wood and yeah. as a side note, the beauty of all of this is you can read a, no, a, a redshift material like a lying node tree from left to right. Yeah, it's like a diagram, a tree diagram. And you can read it, and all of this is highly flexible to a very granular um, detail, uh, possible level of detail. And all of that is paired with a blazingly re uh, fast render engine. And as you can see, I can... Um, instantly uh, rotate here and have all of that being rendered in yeah more or less real time and that wasn't just possible with the good old standard and physical render engine yep absolutely it's just so I totally love it. I also love to play with procedural materials. And yes. um, to be honest, I learned a lot when I was watching your tutorials, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, always very inspirational. Cool, cool. Yeah, more to come. Check out my yeah. YouTube channel. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, um, I think we are at the end, right? Or do you have anything else to show? Not yet. Not is yet. There any cool. questions? Not not yet is a good answer um, because <laughs> that means that we have to invite you again. Yes, please. <laughs> All right. So, as I told you, we will take care of the the questions that you asked that were not related to um, to what Mark showed um, in a follow up session. I'm just gonna copy everything out here so that we uh, don't forget this. Let me do this. All right. And then I'm going to switch to my screen and take care of the housekeeping again. All right. So here I'm again on the Maxon events page. Um, if you are on the Maxon website, news, events, that's where you find it. And here you can find all the live streams that we're doing, but also the um, live events where we are in person. Uh, definitely check this out. Also, when you came in late today or you want to rewatch this um, live stream, you can always go to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. And here there is, um, yeah, uh, this is the place for all the, for all the recordings, uh, also for a little bit more like quick tips um, about Cinema 4D and Redshift. And then we have Cineversity. Um, if you want to learn one of our uh, applications from scratch, we have the Getting Started series. Um, another thing that um, 
that I want to recommend here on Cineversity because um, Mark has a YouTube channel, but his tutorials are really cool. So we also um, add them here. So let me just go to tutorials here. Oh, all tutorials and let's see what we can what we can do um let me search let me search um did you know and here let me click uh render baron here and here you can see all the all the uh, tutorials that mark um recorded and we are also um linking them uh on university so this is a pretty great series here. Uh, Mark just uh, started it. Did you know? Definitely check that out as well. So yeah. Every Wednesday. <laughs> every Wednesday there is a new one. And then uh, I again want to show the, the merch shop where you can get a t-shirt for free. So you just have to click the link that uh, Kyle in the background is going to gonna post in a second there we go and you type in the passcode when you enter the website and then you can order one t-shirt for free here it will say that there is a price attached to it but um during checkout it will be um there will be one t-shirt for free and you only have to pay for the shipping yeah and i think that's pretty much it for today so Thanks everyone for watching. Um, thank you, Mark, for uh, being here. That was a Thanks blast. for having me. It was really cool. Thank you really, so really much. Cool. And um, I learned a lot and I hope everyone else also learned a lot. So yeah, see you next time. I will see say. you next time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.